Comiskey Park, Chicago, the site of the most lucrative fight in the history of boxing. It's September the 25th, 1962, and one of the most controversial heavyweight boxers ever has just entered the ring. The challenger, Charles Sonny Liston, is no stranger to the boos of the crowd. Cast as the bad man of boxing, Liston is one of the most formidable fighters in the history of the sport. Bang, bang, it was like a, like a trip hammer. The guy hit, every time he hit, he broke something. An illiterate who had spent time in jail, Liston's turbulent life was wrapped in rumor and contention, and trouble seemed to follow him around. Sonny Liston was a, a badass fighter, an ex-con, a bully, and a thug, uh, run by organized crime. At a time when the civil rights movement was shaking America, Liston was stereotyped as the threatening black man. There was so much hatred aimed in his direction, and the use of horrible racial epithets was in, was in play. Freely referring to Sonny Liston as a gorilla, as an animal, as a monkey. The bad press that haunted Liston's life pursued him to the grave. His death was surrounded in mystery, and there were rumors of a mob hit or a drugs overdose. But in 1962, Liston already knew that he was the bad guy. Away from boxing, he was shy and vulnerable. But few were willing to see beyond the newspaper headlines, and Liston was left with no choice but to play the tough guy. His birth was never recorded. Life for Charles Sonny Liston began sometime during the depression of the 1930s to a family of tenant farmers on a cotton plantation in Arkansas. In the 60 odd years since the abolition of slavery, life had changed little for the Liston family. They were the poorest kind of farmers in one of the poorest and most segregated parts of America. Sonny was the second youngest of 25 children born to his father, Tobe Liston. The family home was a shack in this field on a cotton plantation in St. Francis County. But we always call him Charles. And we never call him Sonny until after he started boxing. And we all call him Sonny because that's the name he went by. Growing up, he was just a typical boy. <laughs> he was always stocky beer. He was never skinny child. We all lived on the farm, chopped cotton in the summertime, picked cotton in the fall of the year. Sonny grew up like the rest of black people. He was never, you know, around white people unless we went, you know, somewhere to work for them. Like other children of the time, Sonny Liston was expected to help out in the fields from a very early age. His father used to say that if he was old enough to come to the table, he was old enough to work in the field. You have to understand what created Sonny Liston. This is a kid, and I say kid advisedly, in Arkansas. Father's a sharecropper. And he's probably eight, nine, ten years old, somewhere in that range, and the mule dies. And the father, who used to beat the crap out of him anyway, constantly, says, you're the mule. And he's the mule trotting the furrows in the field. You know, he said, that's, I'm not taking this crap anymore. And he ran away. Now, when a kid runs away, you know, he goes around a block and says, oh, I'll show them I won't be home for supper, you know. He goes all the way to St. Louis, from Arkansas to St. Louis, and it's an incredible, uh, in itself, it's an incredible odyssey for a kid to take. Liston's parents had separated, his mother moving 300 miles north to St. Louis. Tired of the constant beatings, the 13-year-old Liston set out to find her. He ran away from home in rural Arkansas uh, and met up with his mother in St. Louis, lived in the worst parts of St. Louis, became a petty thief, you know, as a young 
kid, as a 13, 14 year old kid, and he was gigantic and he couldn't read and he had nothing going for him in this life. You know, he winds up getting into trouble, which is uh, inevitable, I think, for a lot of kids like that. And he's a big guy anyway, and, um, and his size is intimidating. And I think what he discovers when he's a teenager is that his size can be intimidating and he can maybe use that to his advantage. Over six feet tall and without an education or means of making a living, it wasn't long before Liston was in trouble. When he was 18, he was arrested for larceny and armed robbery. He was sentenced to five years in Missouri State Penitentiary in Jefferson City. Ironically, Liston's size would also get him out of prison. They couldn't get anybody to fight him any convict by himself. They had to put two or three in the ring with him to get him any kind of exercise. So I knew he, he had to be a very strong, powerful man, you know. With the help of the priests, Liston was paroled from prison into the care of boxing handlers and given a job at a local construction company. But the company was owned by a mobster and union racketeer, John Vitali. The people that were prepared to put up the money were certainly not the kind of people that we would have been happy uh, to see him associating with, but that's what, hap that's what happened. You know, when, when somebody like Sonny Liston comes out of jail and becomes a boxer, the chances are that he's, he's not going to be, you know, managed by choir boys. Uh, traditionally, it will be slime ball white guys. It will be uh, organized crime figures. It will be tough people. When he wasn't boxing, Liston's new boss made sure he was available for other work. Vitali used his influence with the local unions as a cover for his other mob activities. The Teamsters at that time had anything but a savory reputation and they involved him hired him to enforce their strikes their collection of debts and any other little job that needed to be done well he was a thug um, he was a labor goon in st. Louis he beat people up be in the street because other people paid him money to do so <laughs> Liston's capacity for fighting ensured his progression through the amateur ranks, although sparring partners were in short supply. The difficulty he had in his amateur career was that he was so fearsome a boxer. After a while, it was difficult to get people to fight him. He just had enormous natural kind of gifts uh, as a boxer. And he seemed to have certainly kind of found himself in a, in a way because even though he had natural gifts, to be a successful boxer, you still have to train to have a certain amount of dedication. So he couldn't have been someone who was just totally undisciplined because you, you couldn't succeed if you were. Away from the ring, however, Liston was in trouble again. In 1953, Sonny was on the national AAU boxing team and uh, he allegedly raped a maid in a hotel there in, in Boston where he was staying when she came in to clean his room. And as a result of the allegations, uh, they were going to charge him. But uh, the head of our National AAU Committee here in St. Louis used his influence and got the matter resolved, and there were no charges filed against Sonny. Later the same week, Liston won the World Amateur Golden Gloves Championship. As a black ex-convict in a racially segregated St. Louis, his newfound fame made him even more of a target for police harassment. In 1956, during a dispute over a parking ticket, Liston claimed that a policeman racially abused him. Liston retaliated and struck the officer. He was arrested and sentenced to nine months in jail. Well, it was something he did, he was wrong, and 
You know what I mean? And it, like he couldn't drink. And the only time Sonny got in trouble, if he drank, you know? And he tried to stay away, but then you be out with somebody and you want to take a drink, you take a drink. And that's how that came about. That's what I say. He couldn't drink. And everything that ever happened to Sonny with the cop, he did it himself because he took a drink. That's how that came about. He was released, but he was in big trouble as far as the St. Louis City Police were concerned because he was known as what they call a Nixie fighter, a guy who fight police officers. So they were just waiting to get him in a position where they could render revenge. I don't know how many times he was arrested after that, but I know he was continually harassed by the police, you know. He didn't feel comfortable here in St. Louis anymore, you know. And he said he, he had made references to the fact he wanted to get out of here. Shortly after his release, Liston married Geraldine Clark. She was to provide him with a stable home life. We got married on Saturday afternoon in the sanctuary in the back of the church, you know. And he had on shorts, and um, we, that evening we just went out and, you know, had supper and everything, you know, because we had been together, you know. And um, my mother said that we should get married, so which we did, you know. I enjoyed being married to him. He treated me really nice. He didn't have him to, but I had children, you know, and so he was really crazy about my kids, you know. He was always crazy about kids. Kids was his lifeline. Once he had turned professional, Liston made quick progress and soon developed a reputation as a big hitter. Sonny Liston had a left jab from hell. He could put it through walls, knock down buildings. He was one of the hardest hitters who ever lived. Big bang, boom, fight over. I had 147 fights. Uh, four world champions I fought. I fought nine guys in the top 10. And uh, nobody ever hit me like that guy. Every time he hit you, he broke something. So I went to 10 rounds with him. And he broke my nose, my left cheekbone, and gave me 72 stitches. I was an intimidator until I fought Sonny Liston. Sonny Liston, I think, was possibly the, the greatest intimidator of all time. I've seen him stare guys down where they, they were so scared climbing up the ring steps they could barely get in the ring. Who do you want to fight in the ring in your next engagement? The man got the title. Mr. Floyd Patterson, currently the heavyweight champion. Let us ask you this, Sonny. What, do you, uh, what have you heard are your chances of getting that title fight? I think it's very good from what I hear. Everybody knows that the best heavyweight in the world at this time was Charles Sonny Liston. There was no number two. Everybody knew it, okay? The question was, was he going to be permitted to fight for the title? The champion, Floyd Patterson, was a popular figure. His manager refused to let him fight Liston because of his connections to the mob. For as Liston's career had progressed, figures from higher up the ladder of organized crime had begun to move in. We know that as of December 1960, Sonny Liston was controlled by two powerful racketeer groups. One situated in St. Louis under the leadership of John Vitale, a notorious union racketeer, and the other controlled by Frank Carbo and Frank Palermo. <laughs> Organized crime had muscled in on the world of boxing many years earlier. They were led by Blinky Palermo and Frank Carbo. Frankie Carbo was the 
uncrowned, undercover, Sub Rosa, czar of boxing. And he loved to see great fights. He'd make the fights he wanted to see because when it was over, the guy that was standing was going to be his guy anyway because he would muscle in and take the guy. Blinky was a faithful lieutenant who was out front a little bit more. Sonny was one of his guys. Blinky, yeah, he was a great guy. And if he was a monster, that was his business. You know what I mean? Didn't bother me. He bought, a, bought us our first house. And they, they were great guys if they was monsters. They the one that got Sonny where he was. So you have to thank people for something. If, if he didn't kill nobody that I know of. By 1960, Liston's relationship with Frank Carbo had become the subject of a Senate investigation. Are you uh, associated with or have a business connection <laughs> with John Vitale and Frank Palermo in the management or the contract of Sonny Liston, the number one heavyweight contender? I res respectfully decline to answer questions on the ground that I cannot be compelled to be a witness against myself. They got Sonny to renounce these two. How did they get Sonny to renounce these two guys? They told him, renounce us. <laughs> they didn't care. They're going to get the money. They're going to get it. What do they care if some senator makes a score? It means nothing to them as long as they're free to walk the streets. And, and at that time, they were. Officially, Liston announced that he was replacing his manager. But there was another more obvious reason for Patterson's manager to avoid the fight. Floyd Patterson was managed by a guy named Cus D'Amato. And Cus was a very shrewd guy. He knew a number of things about Patterson. He knew that Patterson was quick, had the right moves in the ring, that he could throw an awful lot of punches, fast hands, fast hands, fast hands. But he may have had the feet of a ballet star, but he had the chin of a poet. And, 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 and Cus knew that. And he knew that if he ever got in a ring with Sonny Liston, we would hear the tinkle of glass just once, and the fight would be over. But finally, the excuses ran out. He could no longer use the excuse, especially to Patterson above all, that this had a lot to do with the mob. Everything had to do with the mob. So how good an excuse was that after a while? Well, there are many obstacles, but I think they have all been removed satisfactory. Otherwise, I wouldn't be here today. Don't come up with them obstacles again. You make me think you cussed them out of <laughs> When my little girl is smiling I can't stay mad at her for long Why should I want to fight When I can hold her tight The fight was agreed. But now many African Americans, including some at the forefront of the civil rights movement, announced their objections. Whatever happened in the ring, Liston just couldn't win. Among the African Americans, uh, there was a lot of concern about Liston fighting for the title and getting the title because of his jail record. They said, oh, he's not, um, he's not who we would want to represent us. He's not the kind of image that we want. You know, this guy's he's been in prison. He's illiterate. He's this and that. He's got all these connections with these white gangsters, and we don't want that. There was a time that boxing was enormously important in the popular culture and imagination of, of America, the way it is not now. So much so that Floyd Patterson was invited to the White House by Jack Kennedy. Jack Kennedy urged Patterson to fight Liston and to beat him. And he was saying basically not only beat him for athletic reasons, but beat him because it's good in the, the, the broadest political terms. So we had the stereotypical, quote, bad nigger, Sonny Liston, uh, against the good Negro, Floyd Patterson. You know, and unfortunately for the forces of truth, beauty, and justice, uh, Sonny Liston was a better fighter. A 
left, a grazing right, and a solid left to the cheekbone. Drop the champion. It took only two minutes and six seconds, but years of waiting, and the new champion is inarticulate in victory. So when he won the fight and came home, we was very excited, you know what I mean? And because I don't think, son, he didn't even dress. I was all dressed up. <laughs> he was so excited. He just wore the same thing, you know what I mean? And he had a hat. He would always wear this hat. You know, he had his hat pulled on his head. And uh, he said, well, it's over. He said, I am the heavyweight champ now. We'll go from here, you know. So we enjoyed it, really did. And the suite was so pretty. And the hotel had sent up champagne and flowers and everything. Really nice. Sure did. When he won the heavyweight championship, he at least thought he would come home to a hero's welcome. And the plane landed in Philadelphia and he looked out the window and it was raining slightly. And he was hoping to see hundreds or maybe even thousands of people on the tarmac, you know, welcome home champ, what, what, the usual thing that you see happening with championship teams or fighters coming home. And there was nobody. And as he stood in the door of the airplane, you know, this guy who was waiting for his great moment in life saw that nothing had happened. No one had come to greet him. And his shoulders just slumped. All the feeling of hope, of acceptance into the greater world, vanished in an instant. He knew then that he was consigned to that corner called Bad Man. It later played out. He moves to Denver and says, I would rather be a lamppost in Denver than mayor of Philadelphia. He hated the city that much for what it had done to him. Maybe it was unfair. You know, maybe he should have been given a new start. Um, but he was so suspicious of the media by that time, and there was so little known, and, and it was so difficult to empathize with him that um, it didn't work out the way he had hoped it would. Well, Liston was reluctant to speak to the press for the same reason a lot of prominent black people at the time were reluctant to speak to the press, and that's because the press was all white. So, I mean, that seemed very understandable to me that he would be very suspicious of the, uh, uh, of the press. He had every right to be because there was nothing in the press that was telling him that the, these people understood the type of person he was. Sonny was really bashful, and he didn't, t t he didn't really talk much, you know. And sports guys always used to, you know, laugh and tell me they wish that he talked like I did, you know, but he just wasn't a big talker, you know. And that's when sports guys used to thought he was mean and everything, but that was just his personality, you know. And he wasn't a brag or anything, you know, Clay, you know, he was a very modest man, and that was his look, you know, and they thought he was being mean, but it wasn't. But that's what just Sonny. We hear you're going to box uh, uh, at uh, an exhibition next week uh, longer than you've ever boxed in your last three fights. Yeah. Do you think you'll go all the way? I, I hope not. <laughs> That's all I know is a few words, and I've said them all. From a news media's point of view, he was a terrible heavyweight champion. Uh, first of all, he was monosyllabic. If he didn't like a question, he would just sit there and look at you. Uh, or he would tell you it's a stupid question and, and, and not answer it. Uh, he was also very intimidating. He used to, when he first started talking, he did, you know, fighting, he did talk to sports, right? He really did. Until they started putting words together, you know what I mean? So you said this and said that. So Sonny said, well, you're going to say what you want to say anyway. So you say it. And he quit talking to him. In his private life, the new champion was very different to the brute portrayed in the press. Well, people always talk about Sonny being such an intimidating figure, and I never saw Sonny that way. He was very large, and they called him the big brown bear, but he was very cuddly and affectionate, like a bear. 
I never ever saw that side of Sonny that's been described as so menacing. He just wasn't like that. He was a fun-loving person. He could give you that menacing growl at times, you know. A lot of times, you know, he would give that menacing growl just to scare a guy, and then he'd turn around and wink his eye, you know, and just, you know, like that, you know. He was, he was really, I, I, I always found him great to deal with, you know. A lot of people say he was a bull, he was a uh, bully. But uh, I guess it was how you related to him, you know. Sonny was spectacular with little children and old people because they were non-threatening. And you got to remember this about Sonny. Sonny, again, was a very threatening guy who broke the law, and I'm not trying to clean up his image in any way, shape, or form, but he was also a guy who was threatened by everybody as well as he threatened people. So the kids and the old people, he loved. Liston's tough childhood was now catching up with him. The responsibilities of being a public figure included signing autographs, and Liston was illiterate. Away from the glare of the cameras, it was Geraldine who set about teaching the world champion how to read and write. Every evening we used to have school, you know what I mean, and I would learn him, well, we restarted for writing his name, you know what I mean, and signing his name, and. And I showed him how to best regard, and uh, he enjoyed that, you know what I mean? He got on real good. On July the 22nd, 1963, Liston fought Floyd Patterson again. The fight lasted two minutes and ten seconds, reconfirming Liston as the heavyweight champion of the world. And here comes the final sequence in the knockout. Despite the win, Liston was again denied the public acceptance he so badly wanted. The public is not with me now, but they have to swing along until somebody else come along to beat me. It didn't take long for the press to move the champion from the back page to the front. On Christmas Day, 1963, Liston was arrested in Denver on a charge of drink driving. Wherever Sonny Liston was, he got in trouble. Now, maybe not every incident was a capital crime, but we can't blame the police if everywhere he goes, he seems to transgress the law. When he got to the police station, the cameras were already there waiting for him. There was a constant war between him and the police. The police wanted him out of town. And I always thought if he had any brains, he would have gotten out of town a lot sooner because this was, you know, this was a war he wasn't going to win. Liston was found not guilty on the drink driving charge, but it didn't take the police long to find another. He went, went in one of these drive through hamburger joints and came out the entrance instead of the exit. Suddenly, there's two police cars there, you know, bang, 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 what did you do? I mean, it's, it's like he stole the crown jewels or something. The guy went out there, he, he took the wrong arrow, but they didn't like him, he didn't like them, and it was shortly after that that he moved to Las Vegas. Las Vegas, the town larger than life where mobsters and celebrities lived the good life, was waiting to embrace the world champion with open arms. The Listons became friends with professional gambler and casino executive Ash Resnick and his family. Resnick had promoted Liston's rematch with Patterson. The Listons would eventually buy a house close to the Resnicks on an exclusive golf course. I just remember as a child going across the golf course to their house, they lived close by. I believe some of our neighbors actually gave my father flack for helping Sonny buy that house because there were not a lot of black families living on the golf course at the time. He loved to surprise me with uh, my birthday with, with uh, parties and uh, mink coats. And I had a mink coat like for every day, you know. and. Uh, he was just a sweet person. He liked, liked to surprise me, do surprising things, you know. Things that he didn't get to do when he was a kid, you know. 
Having tried unsuccessfully to have children together, Sonny and Geraldine fostered a son, Danielle. Danny was his lifeline, you know. He called him Papa Sonny, you know. He's crazy about little Danny. Ladies and gentlemen, this is Cassius Marcellus Clay. He's young, he's handsome. They know it. He's a poet, a prophet, and many people believe he'll be the next heavyweight champion of the world. In 1964, a challenger to Liston's title is announced. A brash young fighter who had fought and shouted his way to the top. This is the fight that everyone has been clamoring for, and as of this minute, it is now official. I'm the greatest. That's why it's the biggest in all history, because I'm here. Known as the Louisville Lip, no one other than himself gave Clay a chance against Liston. Well, I know I draw a sellout crowd. I don't need nobody. They need me. You're lucky you're looking at me, folks. <laughs> Clay, though you look the same when I get through with <laughs> He comes out to meet Liston, and Liston starts to retreat. If Liston goes back an inch farther, he'll end up in the ringside seat. In the build-up to the fight, Clay astonished onlookers with wild and uncontrolled behavior. Many saw it as the crazed actions of a frightened lamb being led to slaughter. I think he should be locked up for uh, impersonating a fighter. If you like to lose your money, be a fool and bet on Sunday. I'm pretty sure people's not a fool to bet on you. They have to be a fool and bet on me. Although a few wondered whether the challenger's bizarre behavior was actually designed to unnerve Liston, nobody thought that Clay could win. The instructions that I got when they sent me to Miami Beach for the fight was as soon as I got there to take my rental car and drive from the arena to the nearest hospital so that I would know the route so well that I would waste no deadline time following Cassius Clay to intensive care. They come out for the pre-fight introductions. And Liston, who's done as traditional, built himself up even on his shoulders, which could serve a sit-down table for six dinner. This tucked all manner of towels under his shoulders to look even bulkier and more menacing. And for the first time, you can see him looking up and up and up. He had not realized how tall Cassius Clay was. He'd never stood next to him. And Clay at six, three and a half was dwarfing him. This was the tallest man Liston had ever faced. Good luck. From the outset, it's obvious that Liston is not in peak condition and has underestimated Clay's ability. And the biggest surprise was when the bell ended the first round. Because there was Clay going back to his corner, not being carried back, as the last two times that Liston had fought. And all of a sudden, you got the impression something was happening different. After Clay backs Liston to the ropes, he verbally challenges the champion, sets him up for the left-right combination that opens a cut under Liston's eye. By round four, Liston was behind. But something strange appeared to be happening. In his corner, Clay was screaming that he couldn't see. And now Clay is screwing up his eyes in pain. Something on the gloves they're complaining has got into his eyes. Round five. More drama, more sensations here now. He claimed he couldn't see, said he felt like he was blind. There's a strong story, and, and it, in my mind, it has some credence. Uh, there's a, a coagulant called Monzel. It's illegal. You can't use it because it's very dangerous to the eyes. And Clay's corner are complaining that something has got on those gloves, and he's rubbed it into his eyes. The story is that somebody splashed Monzel on the gloves. The story that I hear is they did not splash it on by accident. Two of Liston's opponents in previous fights had also had the same problem. Eddie Machen and Zora Foley. All of a sudden, they couldn't see. Coincidence? Look at this. He's taunting him. He's making a fool of the champion. Whatever had affected Clay's eyes hadn't stopped him. 
Liston, who had only fought two rounds in the previous three years, was tiring. Liston was out of shape. Liston is starting to puff like a beached whale. Liston is getting very discouraged. And when that bell rings, Ali has survived the greatest single crisis in his life. And what's happened? Troy has won! Troy has won! Something has happened in Liston's corner, they're not going on, and Troy has won! Liston had quit in his corner. This is only the second time in boxing history a heavyweight champion had quit in his corner. Just quit at the end of the sixth round, claiming a shoulder injury, which nobody believed. And uh, we started to see what was inside Sonny Liston. And it wasn't very uh, appealing. The unbelievable had happened, and immediately, as in all fights, rumors start. I mean, what's a good newspaper reporter without a rumor? There was a betting coup. And Liston adds to this. He hurt his shoulder. What shoulder? He's been throwing punches with that damn arm all fight. When I throw the punch with the left, and I went back to my corner, the whole glove felt like it was full of water. I couldn't, and when I raised my arm, it was, felt like it was, it was laid in the glove. They say it was fixed, and it wasn't fixed, and you know what I mean? And because if it had, like Sonny, if it had been fit, I don't went the first round, you think I'm gonna go seven rounds and get beat upside the head? You know what I mean? That didn't make no kind of sense. Liston had been world champion for less than two years. Having overcome enormous odds to win the title, losing it was devastating for him. A rematch was fixed for the following May, but not for the first time, events outside the ring would influence the direction of Liston's life. How did he bring all of us together? Cassius Clay announced that he had joined the Nation of Islam and changed his name to Muhammad Ali. Why do you insist on being called Muhammad Ali now? now that's the name given to me by my leading teacher, the Honorable Elijah Muhammad. That's my original name. That's a black man named Cassius Clay was my slave name. I'm no longer a slave. With the country locked in a civil rights battle, the heavyweight champion was the most potent symbol of black power in America, and he was now a follower of the Nation of Islam and a friend of Malcolm X. They knew that as soon as uh, if people began to identify with Cassius and the type of image he was creating, they were going to have trouble out of these Negroes because they'd have Negroes walking around the street saying, I'm the greatest. If Liston was every white person's nightmare, Malcolm X was really every white person's nightmare. You know, this black guy is going around talking about how white people are racist and this and that and all this other, all this other stuff. Most people at this point, uh, when the second fight took place, wanted Liston to win because they thought that this fight was coming down to who was going to control boxing, whether it was going to be organized crime or whether it would be the Muslims. And most of all the boxing writers and the boxing establishment, most of the public said, oh, we'd rather have organized crime than the Muslims. Uh, and uh, it was like the Muslims were uh, uh, some, some alien force and, they were, and people were terrifically frightened of them. Just weeks before Liston's rematch with Ali, Malcolm X was murdered, adding fuel to the political fire across the country. The tension in Lewiston, Maine, leading up to the fight was now heightened even further. All week, you had heard rumors. The Muslims were gonna kill Liston. The gangsters were gonna kill Ali. So as you came into the arena, you were frisked. Even women had their pocketbooks searched. Something was going to happen. It was in the air. We were all looking for places under the table to duck. Liston now had the bizarre experience of being supported by the crowd, albeit for the wrong reasons. Good luck. Shake hands, come out fighting. In the first round, and to the amazement of everyone, Liston collapses after being hit by what looks like an innocuous punch. Even Ali couldn't believe it and was shouting at Liston to get up.
half the people didn't see the punch that knocked him down on the other side of the ring. And the crowd is hollering, robbers, bums, give us our money back. And all of a sudden, we've forgotten that we might be shot at. We're caught up in the most improbable moment in sports. Was it a fake? Was it a fix? Was it a dump? Was there a payoff? Was there an assassination attempt? Was it a true fight? Was it a true punch? Was, what was it? The right hand shot on the chin. Joe Walcott, who has lost control of everything, never mind the count, he can't make Ali go to the corner. Liston is looking up like, get this fool away, hit 10, and let's get it over with. Because listen, I'm thinking in my mind, in looking back, not when it happened, but in looking back, I'm thinking, listen, this thing, screw you. I have enough money to air condition hell, and this guy is young, and he's going to kill me. I'm not getting up. And that's what I think happened in that fight. For the first time in his life, Liston had the chance to give white America what they wanted. When he failed to deliver, the press sharpened their knives once again. It was a huge surprise that not only Ali won the fight, but that he should win the fight throwing a punch and, and knocking him out in the first round and a punch that probably should not have knocked out a man as strong and as, as tough as Liston was. He wasn't bitter. He said, you win some, you lose some. And like he said, he's not going to sit there and get his head knocked off. And he said that to me. If he see that he can do it, hey, I'm gone. Let the guy that's better than me get it. Take it, you know? And that's what he did. Muhammad Ali had become Liston's nemesis and the two defeats had left psychological scars that would take a long time to heal. Sonny and Geraldine finally settled in Las Vegas, where they took life easy for a while. Although he returned to the ring, winning 15 of his remaining 16 bouts, Liston would never fight for the title again. Liston earned over $2 million from his title fights, but did not retire a rich man. Financially, Liston didn't get very much out of boxing because the people around him took most of his money and controlled his finances. And you're kind of at the mercy, of, you know, because he was illiterate and everything, he's kind of at the mercy of these people and uh, kind of put himself at the mercy of these people to some degree, partly because he thought these people were strong people and tough people who would look out for him. Of course, remember, there's an inherent beauty in soup cans that Michelangelo could not have imagined existed. Talkative Andy Warhol and Gabby Sonny Liston, always fly Braniff. Now out of work, Liston fell back on the only thing he had going for him in life. His notoriety and size could still earn him a dollar, and there was always someone willing to exploit that. Six months after his last fight, Geraldine spent Christmas with her mother, leaving Sonny at home. Having had no reply to her phone calls, she returned early. I say, oh, that's strange. I see the lights are shown in the house. And I walked in, and the house was smelling really bad. And so I said, Sonny must be cooked or something, let something spoil. My bedroom was the first bedroom. And he was laying there this way. And my son, I pushed Daniel back. I said, get back. You know what? I said, get back. I said, son, is dead. I arrived at the scene was escorted into the uh, bedroom where uh, Sonny Liston was uh, 
laying on the bed. Uh, there was no sign of a struggle. Uh, there were no apparent wounds on his body. That was hard to determine because of the t deterioration of the body. Uh, but there was absolutely nothing to indicate that Sonny Liston died anything but a natural death. searched the house completely. We uh, located uh, a small amount of narcotics in the kitchen, uh, which later proved to be marijuana and heroin. They say some cop, I didn't even know anything about him, never seen him before, but anything, he was sitting there and he said they found dope up under the cabinet, which was a, was a story. Wasn't anything in the house, you know what I mean? The rumors and controversy that had plagued Liston throughout his life now pursued him to the grave. A natural death just didn't seem to fit the script. There are more theories about what killed Sonny Liston, who killed Sonny Liston, why he was killed, whether it was a natural death, whether he was a drug addict, whether, whether he was killed by the mob or whether he just died. All those, there are more theories about that than there are about how many female visitors there were to the Oval Office in the recent White House. Sonny Liston's gravestone says simply, a man. A final reminder from his family that there was another side to the notorious and troubled boxer. St. Liston could have been, in fact, not only a great athlete, it's possible St. Liston could have been a great man. Um, but I think he was uh, misunderstood by his society, stereotyped by his society, um, trapped by his society in a certain way. I think his country, his society, let him down enormously. Sonny Liston was the most powerful, powerless person imaginable. The title he held is the embodiment of power, heavyweight champion of the world and yet he owned nothing, least of all himself. <laughs>